as they were wheeling me in, I was looking in the rooms, you know, the doors were open and there was, I mean, these were people on their deathbed. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're wheeling me in to die. Like, I'm going to die here. Mm -hmm. And that's when, um, that's when it hit that I may never see my kids again. But I just remember thinking like, Lord, if you give me another shot, I promise I'll do it well. I promise I'll do it well this time. Welcome back to Happiness and Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy Award winner, a journalist, a mom, wife, and you know what I like to say, just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. This podcast is brought to you by The Mail Tribune. You can find more podcasts at mailtribune.com. Don't forget to subscribe if you like listening to messages that uplift your life and give you tools to deal with hardships and even tools to help you enjoy the middle ground of life. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss them. All right, let's get to today's episode. Today, we're talking about the not to do list. I love this idea of the not to do list, especially as we're going into the holiday season, which is the season of to do lists. Alana Dawson came up with this idea after a medical emergency. Let me introduce you to Alana. She is a podcast coach. She is the host of the Podcasting Party podcast, and she's a military spouse and a mom. In this conversation, we talk about that medical emergency, what went through her head when she thought she'd never see her daughters again, how that forced her to change her life. You're going to hear about how the not to-do list was born, how it's kept her on track with her priorities, and how you can do it too. I hope you enjoy this podcast, so let's get to it. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you. So I saw you had this idea of the not to do list and I absolutely love it because the to do list becomes about a mile long going into the holiday season. And even though we're in a pandemic, I feel like it's maybe even gotten extra things on the to-do list because now I can't go regular trick-or-treating. I got to create a new experiment experience, yada, yada, yada. So let's just start with what it is. What is the not to-do list? Yeah. So the not to-do list came about after in 2015, I had a pulmonary embolism. It was unexpected. I uh, woke up in the middle of the night, thought I was having a heart attack, even though I was 32 oh and gosh. in the best shape of my life. <laughs> and out of nowhere, um, I just I tons of pain, couldn't breathe. You know, my husband loaded myself and our two daughters, they were nine and six at the time up and drove me to the ER. They couldn't treat me there. So they rushed me to a larger hospital where military family. So at the time we were stationed in Hawaii. Oh my gosh. And so from this, I kind of had to, I, I survived. I was fine. I recovered. It was a long recovery, but in that recovery process, that experience really made me take like stop and take stock of my life. What was I doing? Was I living it the way I wanted to? If I had passed away, what legacy did I leave my girls? Had I taught them everything they needed or I wanted them to know about me and who I wanted them to, to grow into. And so it really made me just stop. It was this really, um, pivotal moment in my life. That's what podcasting came from. My, you know, started a podcast, all of this stuff came out of it. But one of the things that had happened is I realized I was your typical suburban mom. I was running the rat race and I was running it really, really fast and really, really well, bigger, faster, stronger, uh, was my game. Right. So through this, as I decided, okay, what I I can't do it all. And I was in the recovery process. So I literally physically couldn't do hardly anything. What did I want my life to look like? If I was going to design a life that I loved, what would that look like? And I realized that I could only focus on a few things and focus on them really, really well. So it was my kids, it was my family. And then the third thing that I added into that mix eventually was doing what I felt like I was put on this earth to do besides Mm -hmm. love my husband, love my kiddos. And so, but that was really hard for me after for years focusing on not just house stuff, but volunteer and, you know, all of the military things that, you know, I did military spouse clubs and everything. It was all good Mm -hmm. in and of itself. Right. But so much of it in my to-do list was so long that I thought, okay, how do I just focus on these few things right now? And so I had read an article. I don't even know where I wish I could give credit to it. 
but it sparked this idea of why don't I create a not to do list that would free me from all of these things that are not a priority right now. Mm -hmm. And it, it stuck. And so it was little things like, I'm not going to worry about dishes right now. We're going to eat on paper plates. Yeah. That's a life changer. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and as a military, um, spouse, sometimes we would change homes, you know, every two years. And I would think, Oh, I need to make these beautiful, like baskets. And one spring I was just inundated with this idea at our new home that I needed to have these really pretty pots with all these flowers. And I thought, I don't, one, I don't have the time and I don't want to spend the money just to turn around and a year later to have to, you know, I'm not, I have to give it away or pull it out because they won't move, you know, mm -hmm. baskets for us, or they're going to die eventually. So one year it was things like that. So it's been little things and it's also been big things. But I feel like when I create that not to do list, it gives me permission to not focus on those things mm -hmm. and focus in where I really need to put my time and money and effort. What were some of the big things that made it on that list right away? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So the biggest one I can tell you was I had been volunteering mm -hmm. um, and I loved volunteering in my girls' classrooms. I loved it. I loved it. It was super fun and it was great for me, but it had gotten so ridiculous that I had, I was volunteering in a classroom that neither of my girls oh were my in. Gosh, I was worried you were going to say they, that. <laughs> yes, they did. They didn't have spots. All the other spots, because we came mid-year, of course, again, military, mm -hmm. all the spots were taken. And so they were like, well, we don't have room in either of your girls' classrooms, but we do need a, a volunteer in this classroom. Would you be willing to help in there? And I was like, of course. I wasn't going to tell them no. So I literally... I always say I'm a PTA dropout. And mm -hmm. I mean that some women that is, man, that is their jam and they're good at it, but that was not my jam. And I was not very good at it. And so, um, that was the first thing I put on the not to do list after my PE was I am not going to volunteer. And slowly it's been, you know, almost, uh, this December will be five years now. And so just within the last year, year and a half, I've started to volunteer a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And you still do this not to do list. What does I it look like? Do it. What does it look like now that you, you're able-bodied, you're not in recovery anymore. What are you, what does it look like now? Yeah. So now I do it. I usually do it seasonally. So, you know, quarterly kind of as we ebb and flow. So I just did my fall list. And so the not to do list right now looks like, um, I was getting you, a lot of the time it's stuff that gets in my own head. That's mm -hmm. kind of silly stuff, but one of the things you can't see my desk area over here, but it's really messy. And I was like, I need to get an organizational system. I need to read and that led to like redecorating my office, which is something I want to eventually do. So that's one of the big things that made it on the list is like, I'm not going to worry about the stacks of paper. They're just going to stack up for a little bit because I don't have the capacity to do that. Another thing was I was getting ready to develop um, a podcast coach. So I was getting ready to develop a new product. And I thought, you know what? The timing is not right for this. I don't have the capacity right now. So that made it on the not to do list. I'm going to, you know, just put that off to the side for a little bit. Um, and we'll see when it comes back, but that's, those are a couple of the things. How does this impact how you go about the things you do need to do? How does it impact like your, the load that you are feeling and carrying? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked this question because it, that's the whole reason I do it is mm -hmm. because it lightens my load instead of sitting down and making 20 things that I need to do. I can just focus on those three things because the, on the opposite. So I make this not to do list, but every season I also sit down and I make, I set my three to five priorities that I am going to focus on. And a lot of them always look the same. Of course, my, my faith and my family are always going to be at the top of that list. But at different seasons, it's looked like my health has to be a priority or my business has to be a priority. There's been certain friends that need to be at the top of that list for something that they're going through. And so it really frees me up to focus on the my priorities and what I'm going to pour into my to-do list instead of worrying about all these other things. It honestly just takes, lets me dump it, get it out on paper and say, okay, I'm not going to think about that anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, especially as women, we can put all of this stuff that we have to do. And we're constantly, what I think they call it the mental load. And we just have this mental load all of the time. 
how do you think that taking this stuff off and like literally saying it will help people who are listening now seeing like, you know, I want to paint my fence. The summer has already passed. <laughs> like I'm not going to paint it in October. How, how will taking that off my list free up some of that mental load? Oh, because every time it, it comes into, it's, it's like a, a mindset thing, right? What we focus on, it has power. And so instead of always focusing on the fence, I didn't get the fence done. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to go, Oh, that's not something that I'm focusing on right now. That's on my not to do list. I'll get to that next spring or I'll get to that next summer. And it allows you to then free that mental load, right? Free that space for those things that you do want to do and need to do and can pour into. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like that you mentioned is that you do this seasonally because we change as people. And I think it's really easy to decide, okay, this is how I'm going to be this. These are the priorities in my life, but then you don't make room for a changing you and changing needs from, like you mentioned, putting friends at the top of the list or putting your health at the top of the list. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So if there's one thing I've learned in the military, it's that, that everything changes, right? Everything changes, including ourselves, kids. Um, we all know if you're a parent listening that at different times, our kids need different things from us. Sometimes one needs more attention. Sometimes one needs less, you know, you just, there's this ebb and flow to life. That's exactly it. And so by allowing it, and I'll even change it during that season, if it needs to be changed, you mm -hmm. know? So, but it just gives me permission that like, Hey, it's not going to stay this way. And like, right. So for example, right now I solo parent, my husband is stationed apart from us. Um, I always feel like I have to preface that with like, we're very much in love. Like we, we want to be together. <laughs> Military just dictates otherwise right now. So I'm solo parenting. I'm running a business. Um, I'm podcasting. Uh, and then uh, I'm also solo parenting. So my, and, and it's have, a pandemic. <laughs> oh, right. Like let's mention that. Yes. <laughs> Great. Are your kids, you're in Idaho. Are your kids back at school? They are back. Okay. Well, that, yes. that helps you a little, at least a little bit. <laughs> it does. Yes. And they are, the, they're 13 and 10. And so, um, even the homeschooling this spring or the virtual schooling went fairly smoothly for us. Um, but yeah, they are back at school and, and they are both in sports. And so sports started back up here. And so I have this rule that only, we only do one sport per kid per season, because that's all I can handle. Sometimes mm -hmm. I can't even handle that. Um, and so right now there, it's a lot fuller with driving to practices and this and that. And so I know that for this season, my to-do list is going to be a lot longer or my not to-do list is going to be a lot longer. And my to to-do list is going to be a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. And that's just the nature of the beast. Now, when, you know, come the winter, when things slow down and my girls aren't playing sports, then things will look a little bit different. But I think by allowing that space to pick and choose and change um, it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't pigeonhole us into a certain way. Just like I said, I've started volunteering again. That's something that, you know, I said I wasn't going to do for years and now the timing's right and I have the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I almost feel like Lucy from, I love Lucy. Like I'm trying to do the quantity of the things and I'm running around with my head cut off. Um, when really the quality is what matters. So tell me about how the quality has changed in the things you do keep on the to-do list. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, that, you know, before my, um, pulmonary embolism, it was like, like I said, bigger, faster, stronger, right? Like I did so many things, but I didn't do any of them. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't fully present. Um, rarely was I, you know, focused on the quality, not the quantity. Mm -hmm. Cause I was trying to make the most people happy, trying to say yes to as many things as possible, overextending myself, overextending my family. That's something, uh, another thing that happened is my poor family, you know, didn't get the best of me at all. They got the last little chopped up slivers that were left over. And so by allowing myself to just focus on those few things, the quality for sure is much better. I mean, I would not be a podcast coach and doing what I'm doing in my business if I didn't, because I wouldn't have had the capacity to do that, the time or the energy or the effort. Mm -hmm. I love that we both went to podcasting after our aha moments. Let's go back to the pulmonary embolism that night. Like, do you real? did you realize how severe it was as it was 
happening? I mean, not, not when we got to the hospital, I literally thought I was, it was probably a heart attack. We have some history in my family of, on my dad's side of heart issues. And so I thought, okay, gosh, here we go. But I fully expected to get out. In fact, at one point, my husband came back when they knew they had to transport me and they strapped me in like this. I don't know. It was like a gurney, but I was like all strapped in. And so I made some funny comment about, I was trying to make light of it. You know, I said, take a picture. The girls will think I look like a race car driver. You know, it was all like, and he was like, do you, my husband was like, I don't think you understand the severity of what's happening here. And I was like, oh, and so it wasn't once till, till we got to the larger hospital and they willed, willed me in. And it wasn't even the, it was like the, the one up from the intensive care unit. And mm-hmm. we, as he was wheeling, as they were wheeling me in, I was looking in the rooms, you know, the doors were open and there was, I mean, these were people on their deathbed. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're wheeling me into de- Like, I'm going to die here. Mm-hmm. And that's when, um, that's when it hit that I may never see my kids again. And at that moment is when I started thinking and they wouldn't let my kids in. So like they couldn't come see me. Um, And then they asked me to stand on the scale. And I still remember my husband like grabbed me because he got to be there with me and I stood up and I literally, my legs couldn't hold me. Like my body gave out and they were like, okay, we're not going to weigh her. Just put her up on the bed. Um, and it was scary. And then the, they kicked him out and I was all by myself. And I just remember thinking like, Lord, if you give me another shot, I promise I'll do it well. I promise I'll do it well this time. Wow. Not that I hadn't done what it well up into that point, but that was just the season of my life. As I explained earlier, was just, I was running the rat race. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your priorities were became aligned. Yeah. What are some of the things that go through your head as you're considering your life, like whether you're, whether you're going to live or die. Yeah. I think the, you know, the biggest one was obviously the concern for my girls. Mm -hmm. I have a amazing family. And so I knew my husband would have a great support network, but I just kept thinking like, man, did I teach them the most important things? So when they're graduating from high school, I'm going to get emotional here, but when they're graduating from high school, when they're walking down the aisle, when they're having their first baby, will they remember like, here's what mom said, you know, mom always said this or mom always made us. And so now you better believe I make it a point to tell them every single day, how much I love them, how proud I am of them, how capable they are. And I don't just tell them. That's the other thing I've learned from this experience is I show them if there's one thing that I wanted them to know, It was that they could do anything they put their mind to. But as a mom, how can we, we can tell them that, but how do we get that in their head? And so the only way I knew how to do that was to show them. So that's what I'm trying to do is I'm, I try to go after whatever it is that I feel like God has called me to, Um, because again, faith is a really important part of who I am in my life. And so that they'll know. So if anything, God forbid, does happen to me down the road, um, that, they will know that without a shadow of a doubt that I love them, that I'm proud of them and that they can do anything that they set their mind to. Mm. When you came out of this on the other side and you knew you were, you knew you were okay. Everything went well. What are some of the thoughts you have then? What goes through your mind when you're like, Oh, I made it. (laughs) I do get that second chance. I just prayed for. Yeah. I remember the first, uh, the first day that I got to come home Cause I was there for a few days and my husband brought me in. My girls were with a friend and I sat down like in our big recliner. Cause I still was really weak and wasn't able to move. And so I kind of lived in that recliner for a couple weeks, but my kids came home, they came running in. And I remember number one, how loud they were, which was a joy. <laughs> it was a joy. It was like, Oh man, they're so loud. I love it. And my daughter brought me this crystal it was just a little plastic piece she had found at a playground, but she said, mommy, I found you this crystal and I think it's your good luck charm. Mm. And I was like, oh man, may I always, it's, I still have this crystal. I still, it's again, plastic piece, but I still keep it with me. So I think the things that went through my head it was just gratefulness. I was just so grateful for everything. I was grateful for how loud they were. I was grateful for 
how messy the house was. I was grateful for a husband in a command who allowed him to stay with me for a little bit of time. My parents had already planned a visit. Like I said, we were in Hawaii. And so they were coming, they were just a couple days away from getting there. And so I had help. Um, and then the next step though, was like, how do I undo everything I did? <laughs> how all those commitments? Do- Yes. And not just like the, the, um, time commitments, but like, how do I undo this level of like expectation that I've set myself up and other people up for? And I will say that's the one thing that surprised me the most is I still dreaded, you know, I dreaded calling the school and telling them that I couldn't volunteer, but also the teacher because she was amazing and I loved working with her. Um, but I, I called her and told her I couldn't do it. And she said, I don't know what took you so long. (laughs) So, you know, just that grace of other people that so often we're so hard on ourselves when other people are like, well, how does she do it all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there an expectation that you had to work with that you had set for yourself that you, you hit your expectation of yourself was so high. Did you have to work to lower that? Oh yeah, for sure. How'd you you do that? Um, I failed a lot. (laughs) Trial. Those are just steps. And error. Those are steps to the answer. Yeah. Yep. Um, I learned a lot. I don't actually like when people say like I failed. Um, I try to teach my girls like, no, you didn't fail. You just learned something. Right. Yeah, right. Isn't it funny? Um, I, I say it all the time too. And that's something I don't say to my kids, but I say it about myself. We do that as parents. I think it's a practice. We're just totally. practicing. Yeah. So that's exactly, I just had to like, I kind of, um, I told you about my priorities. I sat down one day and I made a list of the most important things to me. I whittled them down to three to five. And then I literally took out our checkbook back then. We were still using a register. I'm probably dating myself. Um, And I pulled out a register and I pulled out my priority list in whatever, in my schedule too. I remember flipping out my book and whatever didn't align with that, those priorities and then I went off of the, uh, agenda. It Mm -hmm. went off of the checkbook so that I was only left. And it was hard. I can remember the first few times that people, um, of course I was recovering too. So I got a lot of grace there from people as far as like obligations and commitments. But I remember something I wanted to do and it was like, take cupcakes to a party. And my husband was like, is it on your priority list? And I was like, no, but it's cupcakes. And he was like, okay, then I'll make you a deal. You can go buy the cupcakes and take Mm -hmm. them, but you can't make them. And so I had help to, you know, friends and family who held me to those standards. My sister sent me, it's one of my favorite books of all times. It's right up here. For those of you watching, it's big magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she was like, this is going to help you read this book. And, you know, hopefully at the end, you'll know, you know, why you were put on this earth besides to be a mom. And sure enough from it, came a lot of this stuff I'm doing today. That is so cool. I'll link the book. In the last five years, you know, humans are so interesting how we deal with something and our brain is like malleable and like goes back to the who we were before. So it's been five years. How have you been able to hold on to that gratitude and hold on to the lessons that you learned from your, from your pulmonary embolism? Yeah, well, I'm still learning there too. Some mm-hmm. days, in fact, this morning was a rush to get out of the house and it was a theme day and one of my daughter's costumes, she couldn't find a piece to it. And it was, you know, um, so I didn't have a ton of gratitude in that moment, <laughs> but um, when she gets home, I'll apologize. Um, but I keep a gratitude journal. Um, I still, I think the practice of continuing to set my poor priorities and my not to-do list really keeps me on track. Um, and just living into the moment. I mean, I will say the one thing I have done well with is keeping my schedule. I have to have white space. Mm -hmm. I have to have, you know, time where I'm not rushed and pushed. And I think that practice has saved me a lot too. um, That's allowed me to, because I've still had some health issues and fallout the last five years. We found out that there were some reasons why I had the PE and some diagnosis that I had to work through and some different procedures. And so um, just keeping those practices, the practice of gratitude, the practice of continually aligning each season, continuing to align that vision and those priorities has really 
really played a huge part. Mm -hmm. I think consistency with anything is a huge, makes a huge impact on our lives. And the fact that you keep going back to it each time is probably a life changer, game changer. I like to ask my guests, the last question is what do you think the number one tip to finding more joy in the good, the bad, and the in-between is? Hmm, I love this question. And so I've been thinking about it. <laughs> it's so hard for me to say like one. It's a hard one. And I, you, I don't tell, I don't tell people before because I want to get like, you're like off the top, well, but you knew, you knew it's okay. Well, only because I listened to the show. Right. And so I was <laughs> Which like, is okay. even better. <laughs> so you know, my answer is going to align with this, with the podcast episode. Maybe it'll, you know, maybe if you ask me again in six months, it'll change, but I think it's having a realistic expectation of what you can do and what you should do. Mm. That's good. That's powerful. You don't, you don't have to do it all. Just do what you were created to do and do it well. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience and sharing this, this tip. I told a few people that I was going to be talking about this on the podcast and the response was like, oh, I need that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the work that you do. It is so important and I'm cheering you on. Oh, thank you. I just love the perspective Elena offered us in this episode and how easy it is to get off track with the things that are our priorities. I'm going to link all of her information where you can follow her in show notes. And I want to thank you for being here and do not forget to subscribe to hear more stories and more tools that will help enrich your lives. Thanks for being here on happiness and progress. (music) 